Hey everybody, welcome back to The Pressing Matters. I'm Scott, thank you for tuning in today and thank you for your support. You may be wondering why Scott is all dressed up today and that is because we're going to the opera. Um, yes, for the first time on the channel, I'm going to cover an opera release and it's a very, very special one. One that I had my eye on and I just had to hear it and I'm so glad that I found this. Um, we're going to be talking about the Lost Recordings release of a 1955 performance by Maria Callas in Lucia, as Lucia in Don Zieri's Lucia de la Mamor. So, um, this is a little bit beyond my technical knowledge, so um, I do not claim to be an opera aficionado. But I'm going to give you a good look at the release, um, some background leading up to it in my journey towards opera and why this unlocked the door for me to listen to a complete opera. So let's get on to this. Um, the Lost Recordings is an outfit in France. They um, specialize in restoring unreleased recordings that they feel uh, deserve the deluxe treatment. Um, this one is a little unusual in their catalog and I'm going to tell you why in a moment. When I was a freshman in college in Boston. I fell in with a group of guys that were a few years older than me. One was 30 years my senior. He was like 50, I was like 20. And his name was Bill. And Bill was other otherwise known as Vera. And Vera was an opera aficionado. Um, I used to visit Vera at his little apartment in the ritzy area of Beacon Hill in Boston and he had walls of records, opera records. He was very, very educated in opera. And here I am, a kid coming out of New Hampshire, just raised on rock and roll, but I really liked this guy, and I was like, you know, I'm gonna sit and listen. And so we would listen to some opera recordings. He'd play different things from different um, artists, and he was really into the divas, of course, and he would tell me stories <clears throat> about their onstage, uh, characteristics in their offstage antics and I heard stories about Joan Sutherland and Renata Tibaldi and rivalries and so forth and of course Maria Callas came up in the conversation as well he would say he said something to me that really stuck in my mind and it planted a seed for me um, he said other artists may have the more beautiful voice the more perfect diction the better technique, he said, but none of them have what Maria Callas has. And I was like, what? He said, the ability to embody a character to the point where, whether you're listening or watching her, you suspend disbelief. You feel like you're witnessing the actual character being portrayed and their range of emotions. She does this with a dramatic acting abilities. And I was like, oh, I, I kind of realized that most opera was about, was about singing, of course. There is a drama going on, oftentimes a melodrama, but I, I didn't really think of bringing acting skills into it. And I think what I got from that was Maria Callas, um, did that better than anyone of her era and probably of all time. Since I've watched um, many um, recorded performances, uh, video performances of Maria Callas on stage, and I understand now what he was talking about. Still, I wasn't ready for opera yet. Uh, I was going through my punk rock phase and whatever. I don't re really remember, but it was pretty much rock and roll, a new wave or punk. This was 1980, so. Um, but I started collecting records in earnest and expanding my musical taste over time. As people were dumping their records in the 90s, I picked up a ton of classical records. Most of my um, RCA Living Stereo and Mercury Living Presence came from that era. Um, just people giving it away, going to CDs. Uh, and during that time, I was visiting 
several thrift shops a day. I would go make the rounds. <laughs> it was crazy. It was so much fun though. That was really, really fun. I was in Boston or, no, at that point I was in New York, so. Um, I would see these gorgeous bo box sets of opera on the shelves at the thrift stores. Nobody really interested in them. I'd see them week after week. And I started picking them up because they were on labels that I knew, uh, London, DECA, EMI, labels that I was collecting for sound quality uh, mainly and to learn about uh, classical music. So I bought these, um, brought them home, enjoyed the physical aspect of them, read through them a little bit, listened to maybe one disc and put it back on the shelf. I didn't understand anything about what was going on. I appreciated the singing but that was about the extent of it. They were more objects to me that I would get to at a future date. And I think, I think opera is kind of like that. It's sort of the last frontier for a lot of people. They may be able to explore every other genre, but for some reason they have a block when it comes to opera. And I was kind of, I wasn't really that way. I had a little opening, a little opening that my friend Bill created in me and I, I was like, you know, someday I'm going to get into opera. The next step for me was to start to explore uh, recital discs. So I, th I felt like since I can't really absorb a complete opera at once, maybe I can absorb a collection of arias or highlights or something like that. Something on one disc that I could focus on. As um, I got into audiophile pressings. Testament had reissued several um, Maria Callas recitals, and I picked those up, and I loved those. And I also found some EMI single discs uh, recitals that I, I loved. So um, I was slowly making progress, and it led up to this point. Um, I started seeing the ads for this a few months back, and I was really intrigued. It looked beautiful for sure. <laughs> Um, if you see the pictures, and I'm going to show you this, the set in close-up, it's gorgeous. It's absolutely gorgeous. As I did more research on it, I was like, oh, okay. So this is the thing. Back in the day, live recordings like this circulated as pirate editions. They were kind of semi-quasi-legal, not really. <laughs> um, editions of live opera recordings that circulated among the fans usually made from a dub of the master or an off-air broadcast, and generally in poor sound quality. These are the type of things that used to circulate. And I remember seeing those, and I've even picked up a couple. I'm gonna show you one. It's actually Marie Callas' performance of Medea with Leonard Bernstein. Um, most of these didn't have any kind of nice artwork or boxes to speak of. It was pretty much a bare bones release just to get the live performance out there for fans to enjoy. Um, this set, um, this recording actually did make it out onto a pirate edition. I think it was on BJR or Cetera. Um, I don't have that to make a comparison and I don't think, feel like there's any need to because Lost Recordings has gone to great lengths with this one. Um, they were searching in a archive and stumbled across the original master tape that was rolling in the theater at the time that this was, uh, this performance was uh, done. It had been under lock and key since then, and they got permission to examine the tape. They found a little bit of damage, but nothing that couldn't be corrected, and they pushed to get permission to, to work on this and to release it in an official release. This release is sanctioned by the Maria Callas estate. So they were involved in it. And in a way, this reminds me of Impex. And even as we go through this, you're gonna be reminded more and more of Impex in that they go for the best, best master possible, um, exquisite care in mastering it, uh, restoration work if necessary, um, excellent annotation and collecting things from the estate to present in the book, uh, wonderful attention to detail in the packaging, and great sound. Um, unlike Impex though, I mean Impex works with audiophile recordings, this is a mono recording done live in 1955. And I didn't know what to expect. 
but we'll talk about the sound in a second. Um, it's a lift top box. In front is, it's like a maroon color gloss with Maria's signature here. And this is their aesthetic for all their releases, but most of them are in blue gatefolds, matte. And they have the same signature type of thing, but none look as luxurious as this. And you can note the attention to detail as soon as you open up. Instead of just being white inside the box, it's lined in black, very elegant. And I thought befitting of this release. As soon as you open it, you're greeted to this. So I was so thrilled to see this. This is a facsimile of the actual program that was handed to you as you entered the theater to uh, witness this performance. I love the artwork on this. It's so cool. Very, very cool. I'll show you it in close up. Um, the advertising is all the original advertising and so forth in here. So it's in German. I, I don't really understand anything, but it's really cool. <laughs> and they could have easily used this as the box design, but I'm glad they went with the understated elegance of the maroon box with signature. Looks great. So this is a really nice addition to this set. There is a card included uh, for downloading um, a, digital, a digital master of this, so you can have a digital file as well. <coughs> the booklet. Well, it's not a booklet. <laughs> it's a book. This is a book. It's really thick. It's beautiful. I mean, I'm going to show you a little bit in close-up, but I'll flip through it here story about Maria Callas, about Karyan, who was the conductor for this, very young, very energetic, and I loved what he did on this recording, um, about some of the principals in the cast. Di, Di, Di Stefano uh, is her co-star, and it's fabulous. A performance that made history. The more I looked at this, and the more I researched it, I realized that this performance, among all others, is treasured by opera files, but for, for Callas fans as well. Um, they just, it's just a perfection in the way she portrayed this character. Her voice was in exquisite shape, and the sympathetic uh, conducting an orchestra is perfect. And it, the fact that it's a live recording is really interesting too, and I'm gonna get to that in a bit. A little bit about the composer here, Donzietti, about the story, the plot, very convoluted, but super melodramatic. I'm not going to go into the plot or uh, the singing and stuff like that. Um, I mean the technical aspects of the singing. I don't have that kind of knowledge, but I will give you my impression of how this went. <laughs> uh, inside, you'll get three um, maroon jackets with a simple numeral on the front and the information on the back. Very nice. Gorgeous, really. I love, I love how simple and elegant all this is. Um, they have their own um, rice paper sleeves, so it says the Lost Recordings and labels that echo the packaging. Very beautiful. Um, these lacquers were cut by Kevin Gray, who we all know and love. And I, I like that his name was in this project as well. When this is shipped to you, um, the records come outside of those jackets, so you don't have to worry about um, them slicing the, um, the jackets on the way to you. Uh, when this package arrived, actually, let me see if I have the, um, the mailer. Hold on a second. This, this was the mailer, and it was pretty beat up when I got it. Yeah, it didn't look good at all, um, all the way from France. But by a miracle, everything was in perfect shape. So that's great. Um, to listen to this, I decided to make it an event, just like I'm making this an event. Um, 
I made sure no one was home because my roommates would probably not appreciate an opera at Opera Concert Hall volume, uh, especially in a complete opera. And I wanted to take this in completely for the first time ever uh, with an intermission in the middle. Um, but I picked the perfect night. I picked a night where I was very open-minded and had read the, through the story and had the lyrics in hand. Um, I prepared the listening room. It was immaculately clean. Um, I prepared myself a beverage and I sat in the sweet spot and I picked up my program and I settled in for the experience of listening to this. I tried to make it as much of an experience as these people had when they went to this performance. I pictured myself being handed this, having heard about Callis and, you know, her triumphs in other cities, and that I was going to finally sit down and listen to her. Uh, I imagined what those patrons must have felt like, and I tried to be one of those patrons. So I sat down in the sweet spot. I dimmed the lights, and I queued up record one. <clears throat> Immediately, I was struck by the ambience on the recording. You know, so many times I've tried to listen to opera recordings um, that were done in the studio. And this is a whole other thing. This, you do get extraneous noises from the audience here and there, but it's not really anything that's detrimental to your enjoyment of this. It is like sitting in a concert hall. And you know how that is. If you've gone, gone to orchestral concerts, there's noises here and there. Um, you can't let that take you out of the experience. But this was uh, actually not a problem whatsoever. Um, I immediately got into the sound. So the sound is mono, 1955. And contrary to maybe, maybe many people's beliefs, uh, good recordings were made in 1955, absolutely. The fact that it was made on site, um, you know, there are some limitations, but I think they did a superb job with the original recording. It surprised me. I was like expecting sort of a historical sounding recording, which means old and scratchy and lacking any kind of excitement. This was not like that at all. It was not like that at all. I was so surprised. Um, as the orchestra kicks in, the orchestra sounds very good. Um, not kind of an afterthought. I think a lot of work went into making sure the orchestra was up to the task here. Um, in terms of balancing the orchestra's orchestral sound with the voices. Once the voices start coming in, it's uh, mostly male voices in the beginning. I thought, well, this is not, this is gonna be boring until Maria comes on. And that's what I thought. And I was like, no, not at all. The male cast in the beginning is riveting. The voices are absolutely beautiful. And I was like following along with it and getting into what was happening in the drama. <clears throat> By the time um, Callas makes her appearance, things are really starting to heat up. And I was like riveted. Uh, I, I heard her um, major, major aria like right before the intermission. And I was like, wow, I can imagine what people thought about this. It was otherworldly the way her voice was carried in this, in this dramatic fashion. Wow, <laughs> I, was, I was very, very impressed. Not only with the sound, but the performance and the engagement of the performance. Never before had I been so engaged with an opera. It was, it was incredible for me. A great stepping stone, a, big, a great learning experience. You know, even though I don't have the technical uh, jargon to explain the singing and what was going on and compare her to other performances of Lucia, I don't have any of that. Uh, and I'm sorry I don't, but there are other channels that can expand on that. But I thought that this would be interesting for people that um, maybe are ready to step into opera and want to try something a little different and out of their ballpark. Um, the second the second half of the performance was just as thrilling. And of course, there are a couple of highlights that are well known that I particularly paid attention to, the sextet and the mad scene. And both were absolutely 
stunning in their intensity and the dramatic sweep of the performance. Everything about it kind of just moves together. It was just lightning in a bottle, really. The conductor, uh, Von Karajan, and the cast, Di, Di Stefano and, and Callas, <laughs> it's, it's amazing combination that just worked. It just worked and this, it's absolutely clear to me now why this performance is so treasured among opera files. It's unlike anything I've heard in all those opera sets I bought. I think because it's live and because it's restored so well, it really comes alive in a way that I didn't expect. And for that, I give it very high marks. Um, it's unlocked a door for me for sure. <clears throat> the box set um, is numbered and it's available directly from um, from the Lost Recordings or from certain uh, audiophile retailers. It, I'm not sure of the retail price, but it's quite pricey. I think it's in a couple hundred dollars. Um, they have a CD set that is about $60, I believe, and a digital download um, that's probably less than that. So it is available at all price points. Um, I particularly wanted the experience that the opera lovers had when they were enjoying the operas at home um, to look at a box set, to undo the box set, to handle the records and have that experience. And I was so pleased with this. Um, I can recommend this highly. Really, it's a touchstone for me going forward for opera. And I hope to cover more opera recordings on the channel. And hopefully I'll learn a little bit more about it so I can tell you uh, more technical knowledge. But uh, until next time, I'm Scott for The Pressing Matters. Thank you for watching and have a great day.